Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Eveltree online seminar series on adaptation to climate change. Today, we have the fourth and last seminar of this series. And the pres presenter is Steve Palumbi. I'm very proud to have him here. My name is Christian Relstab. I'm from the WSL in Switzerland, and I am responsible for the technical procedure. And in my role, I want to make a few remarks. It's important that you now mute yourself, except for Steve, of course, and me now. And you can unmute yourself after the talk when you have a question and when you want to make a comment. You can leave the camera on during the talk. I think it's nice that we have some kind of a social feeling. And I have to tell you that this is recorded on my laptop uh, and it's also broadcasted live on YouTube and it will be, be available later in YouTube. So if you don't want to be filmed, you have to turn your camera off. If you don't want that people know you are now in this session, then you have to leave the session. Everything is recorded. After the talk, you have the possibility to ask some questions, make some comments, ask Steve interesting questions. And you can do that in three ways. You can raise your hand in Zoom. You can put your questions into the chat. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can also put your questions in the YouTube chat and I will uh, ask it or transform it to the Zoom chat. That's all I have to say for now. I want to introduce our moderator, which is again, Felix Guggerli from WSL in Switzerland. Felix, it's your turn. Thank you, Christian, for uh, starting. Um, as uh, we do in these uh, online seminars, uh, we always briefly introduce Eveltree. For many of you, it will be repetitive, but just for those who are not familiar with our network, I would shortly point out what this is about. So Eveltree originated as a network of excellence uh, under the financial support by the European Commission, which um, was in place for five years from 2006 until 2010. After that, uh, this network uh, linked to the European Forest Institute uh, and formed a so-called European Research Group uh, and is still active since 2011 as such. Meanwhile, with 30 European research institutions and universities joining up in this network. And these institutions are all in some way involved in research on evolutionary biology and forest ecosystems, largely focused on trees and their associated organisms. Evil trees activities largely involve scientific exchange, knowledge, knowledge exchange. Uh, for example, this online seminar is one activity in this domain. Uh, Eveltree also uh, supports mobility grants uh, or conference visits. Uh, we're sharing infrastructure and establish, maintain databases and also other kinds of training activities are done in the network. So today's fourth uh, talk in the seminar series is given by Stephen Columbi, as Christian already uh, mentioned. Steve is a professor at Hopkins Marine Station of Stanford University, uh, and his research targets below water ecosystems as opposed to our commonly studied forest ecosystems. But this is what makes uh, this talk particularly interesting. It's uh, species with similar uh, life history traits, I would say, that live underneath the water surface, and it will be interesting to uh, to hear about this perspective um, that we will be hearing about today. So Stephen works, Stephen's work uh, is focusing, among many others, on fish species and corals, as I mentioned, and how they cope with their marine changing environment, how they adapt, uh, and how they should be conserved uh, as species, but also uh, their communities in which they live. Steve started in the Isozyme world still, as I learned today, and um, currently uh, uh, uses methods and approaches that span from genomics and transcriptomics, overseas cave genetics to forensics even. <coughs> Sorry. And I was particularly intrigued by the very broad range 
also of other activities, not only scientific. And these go from writing of non-scientific books uh, to laypersons, uh, all the way to actually performing music with this band, Sustainable Soul. And I'm still not quite sure how soul should be spelled because you find it as S-O-U-L or S-O-L-E, uh, depending on where you look. And unfortunately, uh, the MP3 files were not accessible. Maybe Steve can point out where we can <laughs> listen to this. <laughs> but now we turn our attention to today's talk, which is entitled Ocean Species and the Capacity to Adapt to Climate Change Stories. <laughs> not the forest, but corals and caves. Steve, I look forward to your talk and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Felix, for that. And, and Stephen and, and uh, Christian for organizing all, all this. Uh, I, I totally am behind your basic premise here that the way organisms um, are affected by climate change and how they deal with it and uh, the kind of methods we use to study that are really so similar among different platforms the terrestrial plants terrestrial animals uh, and the ocean and um, it's it's that similarity that really i find incredibly uh, sort of comforting uh, all sets of or people all over the world um, asking these sort of similar questions in similar ways and we're helping one another do that um, you know, Felix said, I got my start in isozymes. Uh, most of you will just be wondering, what is that? That is that some sort of thing that you use to like clean your dishes better. That sounds like what it is. But back in the olden days when you had to grind up organisms and, and take their proteins and push them through a gel in order to see the genetic makeup of them. Um, and since then, um, Actually, to be perfectly frank, I've been asking the same questions over and over with an increasingly detailed set of genetic and genomic tools and getting a better and better, hopefully better and better answer about how organisms evolve and the sorts of genetic and molecular um, machinery they, they have um, to do that. So um, I'm going to basically um, start this um, session and um, kind of launch into how we're approaching this um, in the system that we work in, uh, which is corals, and coral reefs, uh, and uh, with great collaborators uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, but this is not a coral. Uh, this is a scene from Australia two summers ago um, where uh, we saw massive ecosystem disruption because of climate change. And I use this picture um, just to paint the, the picture that these kinds of issues are really incredibly important for lots of different ecosystems, many different organisms that inhabit, inhabit them. Um, and as we see, climate change causing massive ecosystem disruption, uh, whether it's coral bleaching or wildfires or forest range shifts. Um, one of the really stunning things that I think evolutionary biology can do right now is to, is to ask how, how can evolutionary biology help? What can we do with evolutionary tools at our disposal to understand uh, the adaptive capacity of organisms um, to react to climate change? So that's what this, this talk is, is about. It's what's motivating our work throughout the Pacific and the Mediterranean. Um, and uh, it's basically asking, um, how do organisms and their ecosystems evolve? What are, their, what are their mechanisms? This is a shot of a bay called Kalikikua Bay in uh, the big island of, of Hawaii. Uh, it's a coral reef. Uh, and it just exemplifies the kind of system that we love to work in uh, with foundational species, in this case, corals, not forest trees, uh, a lot of other species that inhabit them, invertebrates, fish, et cetera, uh, not birds and mammals, but the communities in terrestrial and marine systems are really so similar to one another in that they're highly reliant on foundational architectural species and that that reliance leads to a huge amount of diversity and productivity uh, that many human communities depend on. So uh, we're going to talk about corals, we're going to talk about um, the cave work that uh, Nuria Tejido has, has really led in the Mediterranean, and I'm going to bring this back to communities to ask how can we actually use this information we've got um, to, to help inform communities, human communities, about what to do in the case of adaptation to, to climate change. Um, 
So uh, you've probably had uh, slides like this before. Um, how do species actually uh, respond to climate change? And, and I've seen this slide in many different kinds of ways uh, in, in lots of different for formats. Um, the way I tend to put it is that they, species can move, they can acclimate, adapt, or they can die um, as, a, as a function of how the environment um, changes. I, I, I do have to say that we humans have a fifth way to reacting to climate change, which is no way. Um, luckily, in my country especially, that's become less and less and less of a response. And as, as a response, um, we're now basically looking at more of an active way of intervening, perhaps, in the world to help um, blunt the impacts of climate change. And, and I'll end on that note about, about um, interventions as a science that is uh, one, of the, one of the ways I see a lot of this going. Um, and then here's the setting that I want to start with. These are the coral coral reefs of the of the Pacific. This is a shot of us on a boat uh, coming back to the Palau International Coral Reef Center in Palau, which is in the Western Pacific, about nine seven degrees north of the equator. Um, and what we're doing uh, here uh, with all these people that are displayed along the bottom, um, our uh, research associate uh, Victor Nestor from the Palau International Coral Reef Center, uh, postdocs, grad students, um, community leaders. Essentially, we're sort of asking where in this set of corals that are around the Palau and Archipelago, can we find any um, that are more adapted to heat than, um, than others? Where in this, this sort of set of different kinds of coral environments can we actually find organisms that might be uh, able to adapt to, to future climate um, issues? Um, I'm sort of going pretty fast into this uh, just to be able to cover lots of different sort of systems. Um, and the way we tend to test these uh, is to take corals from their reefs, bring them back to the lab, set them up in standardized heat uh, stress experiments that are sort of shown here in each of these, each of these um, coolers. Uh, they're subjected to uh, essentially a heat pulse. Uh, that mimics a standard low tide during a sunny day, uh, bringing the temperature up to 33 or 34 or 35 degrees, depending on the tank, and then and then recording the reaction of each of these each of these corals to uh, those particular conditions. And and we've set this up as a way of essentially being able to map the relative heat tolerance of individual corals to uh, to to their environment. Um, and just to sort of give you an idea what that what that looks like, um, this is a set of uh, branches from five different corals. Um, they're uh, arrayed across the top, the five of them. The ones on the top have been subjected to a normal 30 degree control. The ones on the bottom have been um, subjected to 34 degrees of centigrade for about three hours uh, during the, the daytime. And uh, what you can see is a is a is a change in the color of these individual coral fragments. Um, the one that's that's labeled heat sensitive there um, is bleached. Uh, it's gone from its normal color, which is very very dark at the top, uh, and at the bottom after this three hour heat exposure. Um, then that color is gone. Essentially what has happened here is that these individual corals have expelled their internal symbionts. Uh, that's a process called coral bleaching and I'll talk a little bit about its, its under, underpinnings in a, in a few minutes. The uh, other corals though from this same environment react very differently. So this one over here on the left, for example, essentially sees the same exact same um, two environments and reacts by not changing at all. And so in this, in this environment, this is just one reef, um, there's a wide variety of different coral reactions to the same environment. These corals are all the same species, they have all the same symbionts, um, and yet they react very differently. And that's the raw material around which I'm sort of building this set of studies, because that variation in bleaching and its sensitivity to heat is essentially could be uh, the, uh, the basis of adaptive capacity of this population um, to heat waves um, in, in the future. 
So, but what is coral bleaching and then how is it possibly uh, studyable and relatable to, to this phenomenon? And this video basically is not in Palau, it goes to a previous study site called American Samoa on this island of Ofu. And we're just going to zoom in and find the corals on uh, the reef here. Um, this is a sort of the back reef area we work in. Um, corals are shown here. Um, they are colonial animals. Uh, they are branching calcareous forms that each of them is made up of uh, thousands of tiny polyps. Uh, each polyp here is a ring of tentacles. Uh, that ring of tentacles is a mouth in the middle of it. It's surrounded by other polyps are genetically identical. Uh, so this is a modular organism, a lot like forest trees. Um, the color, though, in these corals is not the coral. The color is made up of a set of small symbionts, and as the focus goes up and down here, you'll see the globes of the symbionts. And those symbionts are uh, dinoflagellates, they're photosynthetic, and they reside inside some of the cells of the corals. And we are going in now to the two cell layers that make up a coral. The epidermis is the outside, the gastrodermis is the inside. And in some gastrodermal cells, about maybe um, 10, 10 or 20 percent of them, we see these dinoflagellate symbionts. That's the photosynthetic machinery. The yellow here is a set of very strange chloroplasts that dinoflagellates have. Um, they're reticulated chloroplasts, so they're not, they're not individual small chloroplasts, but they have the same kind of thylakoid membranes as other chloroplasts do. Um, and in those thylakoid membranes float the protein complexes of the photo photosystem one and two shown here uh, that normally collect photons. They turn that, those, that photon energy into food energy and they pass that uh, to the corals. Um, yet when these systems heat up, these photosystems break down. And when they break down, uh, instead of being able to take the photos, uh, photo, <clears throat> photon energy and convert it into chemical energy, that energy is dumped into oxygen radicals, and those oxygen radicals diffuse out through the symbiont. That disturbs the symbiont, it disturbs the, the coral cell, and the coral cell spits the symbiont out. Um, and that process then leads to um, coral bleaching because not only is one cell spitting the symbiont out, but other cells in the same part of the colony are spitting their symbionts out because they're all exposed to the same heat. Once a couple of them start going and then the whole branch and then the whole colony, effectively the colony loses its color because it's losing its symbionts. And that leads to, to widespread coral bleaching, not only uh, within a branch and not only within a colony itself, but many colonies um, on the reef. So when we see in the experiments that I was just showing you that some colonies had turned white and some colonies had retained their color, it means that some colonies had actually expelled their symbionts and some colonies had not. Um, they differed hugely in this bleaching, bleaching reaction. So uh, that bleaching reaction uh, is fundamental to the life of the coral because the symbionts actually provide about 75% of the, the metabolic energy that corals use. And as a consequence, that bleaching then um, not only uh, leads to a lot of coral death, but even if the corals don't die, it takes them a long time to survive and, and, then, and then start to grow again. So it's a fundamental attack on the fundamental architectural basis of this, of this entire um, community. So um, we're basically asking uh, in, in Palau, effectively, where can we find heat resistant corals? I'm sort of, again, jumping ahead a little bit quickly um, to show this map of where we find corals that when subjected, in this case, to 35 degrees, they show little or no coral bleaching as opposed to completing complete bleaching, which is um, sort of the standard for um, this species of corals in this habitat. Um, in this case, this is work that uh, was spearheaded by Brendan Cornwell, a postdoc in my lab, plus uh, <coughs> Katrina um, Hounchell, uh, Neil Walker, two grad students. Um, and done in collaboration with the folks at the Palau International Coral Reef Center. Um, we've studied 400 corals on 39 reefs scattered around Palau. Uh, we've tested them all multiple times at multiple temperatures. And then the red dots here are the locations of 
heat resistant corals around this this archipelago. So our goal was essentially to find to create a map of where we would find these um, heat resistant colonies in order to begin to not only study the basic biology of them, but also to try to understand where if you wanted to use them for future uh, ecosystem interventions, where would they come from? How would you get them? Um, what we see here is that uh, heat resistant corals are actually pretty widely distributed across these reefs. We find them in at least two thirds of the reefs that, uh, that we have studied. Yet, even though they're widely distributed, they tend to be concentrated in certain places. They tend to find them more in some places um, than, than others. So, for example, um, if we look at different regions of the Palauan uh, archipelago there, and, and we've got the reefs that are numbered that we've studied here, uh, they're divided up into, into eco-regions by the, the colored boxes. And then what we can see in that graph there is the, the fraction of the colonies that we've tested from these different regions um, and how many of them are in this more heat resistant um, category. And what you can see just from this is that um, the east and the west, uh, the green and the red bars here, um, have the highest fraction of those colonies. We find some in the south, we find some in the north, but not as many. Uh, so there's regional differences in the uh, in the availability or the uh, the density of these heat resistant colonies um, that uh, actually correspond to slightly warmer reefs. So when we take temperatures of these reefs, then there's a um, positive relationship between the heat of that reef and the fraction of the colonies in it that are that are heat resistant. But it's a pretty messy relationship. Um, it's not a one to one prediction from heat to um, to heat resistant colonies. So it gives us, us an idea that uh, the variation is pretty widespread, the variation in heat tolerance, um, and that it's worked on by the, uh, the fundamental ecosystem a little bit to change abundances, but there's a wide variety of variation uh, that's there. So um, what can we actually do with that information? Uh, actually, the setting for, for this is also a set of communities around Palau that are quite interested in restoring and repairing coral reefs uh, around the islands. This is a community called Kaingal. Um, it's in a, an, an atoll just to the north of the main Palauan Islands. Uh, and that community came to us and asked us if, if we would help them learn how to do coral reef restoration. Um, not that they really cared that much about the corals, what they really cared about was the fish. Uh, they're Corals have been damaged by a set of typhoons. Um, they hadn't come back uh, due to um, the water being a little bit too warm and, and other issues. And so the, the question was, could we help them learn how to restore reefs um, and rebuild the, the corals that are then the basis for um, their, their fishing industry, their local fishing industry? So we basically started that process um, uh, with this set of people. Uh, but here's the question, sort of asking asking all, all of you, what do we do? We, we can we can show we did show these folks how to actually do coral transplants. It's not that difficult. It's just time consuming. Should we recommend that we take our map of heat resistant corals and say, OK, here's some better corals for you to plant? because we know they're heat resistant. And if you plant heat resistant corals, then in effect, you'll be planting a coral reefs that are more resistant to, to future climate change. Should, should we do that? Should we make that assertion to them um, and, and suggest that that's, that's the way to go? So um, I'm sort of gonna plant that, that question in, in your head because we're gonna, we're gonna come back to that. And I spend a little bit of time digging into um, to how we might actually be confident in that answer enough to make a kind of recommendation like, like that. Um, and, well, while we're thinking about that, I want to take a little bit of a bigger focus and, and ask how common is it that organisms like corals, very simple things, uh, very simple animals, um, have the capacity, have the genetic diversity and the capacity to respond uh, to, to climate change and in a way that might be adaptive in um, in the future. And, and here I want to sort of change focus uh, for a very different kind of, of corals and talk about work that's, that's um, spearheaded by Nuria, shown here. 
Um, Nuria is a researcher at the uh, Station Zoologica in, in Naples, uh, based in their field station um, in Ischia on the Bay of Naples. And um, the project that she had been doing um, partially with my lab, um, partially with her own new lab in Naples, is to look at the Mediterranean corals uh, that were living in, um, not in this case, uh, places that were subject to high heat, uh, but places that were subject to high levels of, of CO2. Um, so this is a similar kind of question. Is there the capacity of these simple organisms uh, to react to different environments that are related to climate change? In this case, the environmental change is not heat, it's CO2 levels. Um, and in this case, the CO2 levels are driven um, <clears throat> not by well, CO2 is in, in the in the system is not driven by current climate change um, because the CO2 levels in the ocean are going up, but they're not going they're not at the point yet where they're causing massive coral disruption. In fact, this is a natural system in the Bay of Naples where um, there's a set of uh, CO2 vents that increase local CO2 levels. Uh, Nuria has spearheaded uh, the study of this set of uh, this kind of corals. Uh, they're called asteroides. Um, they're sort of pictured at the top, the top right here, and uh, and what this shows is the study system that that she um, has discovered and, and made uh, popular around Ischia. Um, Ischia has a set of uh, CO2 vents. People have studied those CO2 vents before um, in the sort of outside areas of the of the island. Um, uh, what Nuria has been working on is a set of CO2 vents inside cave environments along the coast of the island of, of Ischia. And the, the importance there is that the fauna in those caves is very different than the fauna out on the outside rocks, and it includes this set of coral species like, like Astroides. Um, the work uh, has gone on for the last last couple of years, and what it's shown is that in these different cave environments, uh, the the red dots are some of those vent cave environments. The pH in those caves is much lower uh, than the ambient, and that's shown on the uh, the graphs to the left here from a paper that uh, Noria spearheaded in Global Change Biology just just last year. Um, it's a little bit uh, more extreme at deeper parts of these caves, but in the shallow parts, even at, at something like two meters, uh, pH ex, uh, excursions um, are much lower than you'd ever find out in um, out in the ambient. Now, pH makes a difference to corals because they're calcareous organisms. They lay down a calcareous skeleton. Um, and the way that they actually make a skeleton is by effectively um, taking CO2 from the environment and calcium ions from the environment, bringing them together and metabolically upping the pH to 10 or so. Um, by doing that, they can get calcium carbonate to precipitate and form the skeleton that the coral then grows on. So this is a sort of very chemically modified, small little tiny seawater system that they, they conduct right under their polyps. And that's how they manage to, to essentially grow um, a calcareous skeleton. That is harder if the pH is lower. It means that that animal has to actually push um, the pH up further in order to get the same kind of calcification. And so there has been interest all over the world in um, the, the role of CO2 in coral growth and the future of coral reefs around. So uh, it's a different kind of environmental change than heat, uh, but it's threatening to corals in the future, and it also is, a, is, a, is being driven by CO2 abundance and climate change. Um, so uh, what was um, the approach here was to essentially look at the individual corals in these caves, some of which had regular uh, ambient pH because they didn't have these CO2 vents, some of which um, had lower pH, and compare the fundamental growth and, and characteristics um, of them. And this was this was done by a team that Norio organized um, that included a large number of folks from uh, from Naples uh, and um, <clears throat> all over northern Italy. Uh, that essentially was able to look at how these colonies had were growing in these different uh, these different environments. Um, 
Let's, let's go this way. Um, I noticed that Chloe was on the, uh, oops, sorry. Um, was uh, in the in the audience and, and Chloe, I just couldn't help but um, make use of this great figure. Um, so this is a, uh, a photo of Astroides that Chloe put on her on her Twitter account. So uh, and so it's a great way of sort of just looking at the inner, innate beauty of these of these tiny animals and the uh, it's basically they're living on the sides of rocks in these caves and although they are they're full scleractinian stony corals they don't grow to make reefs because the water is just a little too cold they're not photosynthetic either which means that they don't grow um, very fast but thanks chloe for this this um this figure just setting uh the, the setting of where we where we are um the work uh, on those animals uh, looking at the basic ecology and i'm sort of really taking a whole set of data from uh, this global change biology paper and, and boiling it down um, showed that uh, in ambient cave settings um, this is the figure on the upper upper left here uh, the colonies tend to be bigger um, than in the vents um, yet strangely uh, when the actual growth rate of these colonies was measured uh, by looking at changes in the skeletal features of them and then by doing some very careful um, photo quadrat work um, in the field uh, then effectively what what was found was that the vent populations are growing a little more slowly uh, in sort of their linear extension rate than the other populations and their and their calcification rate is a little slower in some cases than others but honestly there's not a whole lot of difference these populations of corals, even in very low CO2 or very high CO2 environments, um, don't seem to be showing the same kind of reduction in calcification rate and growth rate than we'd expect uh, from other corals um, similar to that. So uh, the, the, the end of the result for this particular part of this set of um, studies is that um, these animals living in these caves um, are experiencing a pretty strong CO2 environment. It's as if we had taken the, the whole Mediterranean and then moved it forward in time 50 years uh, to the, the CO2 levels we would expect by about um, 2070 or so. Um, and yet uh, they seem to have already, already have uh, been adapted to it, um, even though um, these caves probably haven't uh, had these corals in them for a very long time. So um, the setting for that was that it looks like there's some level of adaptation going on and Nuria and her team is right now in the middle of doing transplant experiments back and forth uh, through those. Uh, our job, um, in addition to being able to go to these caves and see how amazing and wonderful they were uh, during the field work, was to look at the genetics of them. Um, so. Um, we took uh, a representative sample of individual corals from uh, the different caves. Um, Guatemago is the main vent site. Those are shown in red here. This is just a standard um, principal components um, analysis of the genetic variation that we see in this case, about 46,000 SNPs that we get from um, transcriptome uh, data. And uh, what you can see is that these particular populations are really highly divided up, genetically speaking. Each of these populations is quite distinct um, from one another. The average FST is about uh, 0.06 or 0.07, um, which is pretty high for marine organisms in populations that are very close together. These corals have relatively low dispersal ability. They make larvae that actually don't um, live in the water column for very long and it's been known for a while that local cave populations of corals and even deep water populations of corals in the mediterranean and in the atlantic are relatively um, small scale genetic structure so we see these populations are quite distinct from one another in their genetic structure um, they're all quite different. The question really was, what sorts of differences do the populations at Grotomago have compared to the others? And can we try to tie any of those differences in uh, to potential mechanisms of calcification? So what we did was to take those uh, SNP differences, 
essentially look through look through them, filter them uh, to see which ones were really standout differences, um, which ones were different in the Guatemago population from all the other uh, populations we had uh, we had surveyed, uh, and and just sort of going quickly into that, what we find is. Uh, that there were at least 13 different genes uh, that had a wide number of different SNPs that differed enormously in the vent populations compared to the ambient populations. And that each of these 13 genes, um, well, there's many other genes in that, but these 13 are related to the calcium balance uh, within cells. Uh, some of them are myosin uh, that need calcium levels in order to be able to function. Uh, but there's also there were also a large number of other genes that were part of the calcium cycle in uh, coral cells, including calcineurin, um, a set of G protein couple receptors that move calcium around. Um, and, and in particular, this last gene down at the bottom is a V-type proton ATPase, that's the gene that sits in the membranes that essentially uses ATP to move calcium in and out of the, um, the, the layer that um, allows the coral to, to make its skeleton. Um, so we, we don't know exactly the function of these uh, changes yet in these populations, um, but it was remarkable that the populations that we saw inside uh, the caves in Gartamago in particular had a whole set of uh, changes in genes that were related to calcium um, in a way that might suggest that they had adapted uh, to lower um, calcium levels and lower amounts of pH um, in the system. That, that work is still going on. We've got transcriptome data um, from uh, Noria's original experiments and her transplants uh, to, be, to be working up. But it's a system that allows us to start by asking, okay, uh, the populations are genetically different. Um, we see that there are differences in how they react to um, the pH. Uh, that we don't expect and how are these things put together um, have these populations adapted and what are the mechanisms by which which that that happens um, so uh, where i kind of um, departed from from that in, to do this story uh, was here in in Kyangle. and uh, essentially we have the same kind of question going on here in the mediterranean as we do in in Kyangle itself um, so uh, I want to sort of bring us back uh, to this, this basic question. Um, we know there's variation in the corals in Palau for heat resistance. We know there's variation in the corals in the Mediterranean for uh, to resistance uh, to lower growth because of low pH. Um, how do we use this information to try to take the next step in, in both understanding the biology, but also um, using it in a, in a practical way? And here's where um, you folks in the audience who are plant biologists uh, know the answer because plant biologists do this all the time. Um, there are lots of different ways that organisms react to the environment and some of them um, are <clears throat> adaptive uh, and they come from different mechanisms and they have different different ways of uh, any kind of organism has a different way of looking at different uh, reacting to different uh, environments. Um, in, in the case of corals uh, in particular, um, uh, they can acclimate to the environment as well as adapt to it. And so that is sort of the, un, the one of the fundamental issues that we have to, to come to grips with. In the case of corals, they have a third way of dealing uh, with different environments. They can change their symbionts. The symbionts themselves are a cluster of about um, six different major types in corals in the Pacific. Uh, there's two major genera of symbiont that they can have, and they have different, um, different heat tolerances themselves. Uh, so among the different ways that these different kinds of um, heat resistant patterns can be generated, acclimation and changing the symbiosis and adaptation, they have some fundamentally different properties. And, and the, the main, main different property uh, that I want to emphasize right here is that one of them is permanent, but the others are not. So acclimating to a different environment, which plants do all the time, um, is great, but you move a coral or a plant to the other environment and it changes how it reacts. Same is true of the symbiosis. 
um, if it can change in one environment, it can change in the other. It's really only evolutionary adaptation based upon the genetics of the host that would be permanent for that individual. And so if we want to try to use these individuals in some sort of management or restoration or rebuilding scheme, then we have to have some idea whether we're talking about permanent heat resistance in this case, or whether we're talking about temporary heat resistance that's came, that comes from acclimation. Um, there's been other studies like this. One just came out um, spearheaded by Zach Fuller in science about six months ago on heat resistance in a similar species of corals, on a coral in the Great Barrier Reef. This is a, a, a branching coral called uh, Cropra millipora. Those are the white and pink and yellow colonies here. And they tried to look at a combination of intensity and individual genetics to try to understand the role of individual genetics on the bleaching phenomenon. And what they found in, in this figure here to the, to the right is that um, the biggest component of the re re relationship between bleaching and individual colonies uh, was the environment and where you found those individual colonies. Uh, then there was a component of the symbionts, which is here. And then there was a component of the actual genetics of the colony, but that component was relatively small. It only ends up about 5% of the entire variation in heat resistance in this study uh, was due to the, the individual genetics of, of those colonies. And that's the difference between uh, this dark blue bar and this dark green bar. So it's significant and it means there is genetics involved, but in this particular study there was not a, a lot of the reaction of the corals was not the in, intrinsic genetics of those colonies. A um, couple of different reasons why we don't think that this is necessarily representative, mostly because the actual phenotypes of these corals were field collected data after a bleaching event. Uh, they weren't really standardized peat reactions. Um, of these corals. Um, and so what we've tried to do is essentially do a similar kind of study um, of these corals and essentially uh, do what plant biologists do all the time, which is a common garden study. Essentially, you've got organisms living in different environments. You want to know how much of the uh, physiological differences there are uh, that come from the environment itself and acclimation. And so you grow those same organisms in. Um, in the same environment and then ask whether or not uh, they retain those those characteristics. In this case, uh, these particular studies were done in OFU um, and we took uh, colonies that um, are from a warm heated back uh, back reef pool and other colonies that are uh, were in a much cooler environment. Um, we knew from five to ten years of study of those two pools that in fact they those colonies had different levels of heat resistance. We moved them into a common garden setting and then basically tried to ask uh, do we see those same levels of heat resistance um, uh, maintained. Um, we know from other transplants that we've done that when you move colonies from one from a warm pool into a cool pool uh, that they drop their heat resistance when you move them from a cool pool to a warm pool they increase their heat resistance what's shown in this graph is a set of 11 different colonies that we've moved re reciprocally from the warm to cool pool um, the red bars are the heat resistance that you see in that colony when it's been living in the a warmer pool for about a year, um, same colony, different fragment, living in the cooler pool has lower levels of heat resistance. So we know there's acclimation going on um, because of data like this. Um, but we also know that there are some, that about half of the difference between these heat reactions um, is acclimation and about half is not acclimation. That is about half the difference between pools. Uh, you can um, change by moving the colonies, the other half is fixed. Um, we know that the control of genes in these corals is also uh, both fixed and, and highly, um, <clears throat> highly acclimatory. Um, and so as shown here, a set of, of gene expression patterns um, that uh, change expression levels uh, depending upon where the colony lives. That's the set of genes on the um, 
on the top. Uh, there's another set of genes that change their expression levels, not depending upon where the coral lives, but where it's from. And those are all the genes on the bottom, uh, the bottom level there. Uh, it just turns out that there's about the same number of genes that are that are acclimatory as um, as fixed in their gene expression levels um, in this particular study. Um, the reason that we did it this way was to basically try to, to dig in a little bit to the mechanisms by which corals were actually reacting to the environment and, and changing. Um, so we know there's a mixture of adaptation and acclimation in these corals, um, perhaps about 50-50. Uh, what happens when you actually do the common garden um, experiments? This was done by uh, Megan Morikawa uh, for part of her dissertation, um, moving corals into uh, from two different pools, uh, warm and, and cool from four species in the common garden setting. And then um, essentially looking to see what happens after uh, you let them grow for about a year. Um, and what, we, what Megan was able to see in that uh, was essentially that uh, grew quite well. Um, the, the diagram here is uh, essentially looking, this, this particular replicate of this has four different species growing on it. Um, each of the um, species is half from the, from parents from the cooler pool. Um, and that is, a, those are the ones uh, that are outlined in blue and half the parents um, come from the warmer pool and those are the ones outlined in red. Uh, then uh, this experiment was going on in 2015 when a natural bleaching event came across these. Uh, and then what the, the, the data showed was that um, the coral nubbins, the transplants that came from heat sensitive parents bleached about two or three times more than the coral nubbins that came from um, parents, parent colonies that uh, were more heat tolerant. It showed that when you do these experiments and bring them in a common garden setting, that you do in fact preserve some of the differences that were intrinsic in the colonies that you collected from the field, uh, meaning that at least some chunk of the differences we see in heat tolerance in these four different species uh, were due to intrinsic differences, not just a acclim acclimatization um, due, to, due to the environment. So some fraction of this heat tolerance is due um, to, to fix differences, um, either the genetics of the colonies themselves or, per or perhaps epigenetic changes, both, both are possible. Um, so one possibility then um, is to be able to go to a community and say, well, if we do the common garden experiment, we can explain how much of the variation we see in the map um, in heat tolerance is due to intrinsic differences. That is how many, how much of that differences is actually uh, permanent and how much we can rely on. If we have that information, then we can go to the Kyangal community and say, yeah, let's do the experiment. Uh, let's set up some nurseries with common gardens of corals that are of different heat capacities. We can then test them and then come up with differences that um, we can we can be relatively sure that these really are heat resistant corals and that you could use them and expect them to retain their heat resistance in the future. So one stage of being sure about this entire approach is to do the common garden experiment and re reduce the impact of acclimation on the results so that we can be a little bit more certain how to, how to talk to communities about how to, how to grow corals and restore them. But it's more than that, right? Because there's also possible that one trait that we study is not the only trait that's important to these corals in the future. And in particular, um, the question remains, do, do, does heat resistant come at some cost? Uh, and if we understand that cost or we don't understand that cost, then you might actually have a very different kind of approach uh, to the management. Um, and trade-offs are pretty common. Uh, trade-offs are in um, environmental stress resistance and other traits are really common, particularly in the plant literature, right? If you've got, uh, say, strong drought resistance, you can also have lower growth sometimes. You can have um, high heat resistance in some, in some plants. So you can have uh, lower resistance to, um, to, to water stress. Um, so trade-offs are a really pretty common feature of the evolution of populations in uh, a mixture of environmental, um, environmental circumstances. Uh, and what can, we, what can we say about the trade-offs in coral 
heat tolerance and what else might be going on. A little hint of that was suggested by Ross Cunning, shown here, who is a grad student of Andrew Baker's in Florida. Um, five or 10 years ago. He's now um, a researcher at the, the Shedd Aquarium in, um, in Chicago, based in Florida with their collecting boat there. Um, and what Ross noticed uh, was that corals that had more symbionts actually tended to bleach more. Um, that depending upon the symbiont load in a coral, um, if it was a lot higher than at a heat event, those corals were dumping more of their algae. And he attributed this uh, to the reaction of the symbionts to heat that um, might actually damage the corals more, the more symbionts there were, and perhaps have a stronger reaction of the coral because, because of that. Uh, we happened to be able to have data in Palau to test that. All the 400 corals that we tested for heat resistance were also mapped and photographed. Uh, and we could go back after a year and find the same corals, rephotograph them, um, compare their uh, growth rates essentially in the field over, uh, over the year. This is from 2018. 2019. And effectively, then we have then um, three different phenotypes. We have the heat resistance, I showed you, uh, that we also know how many, what the symbiote load is for those corals. We have to know that in order to calculate heat resistance. And then we have the growth rate of these particular corals. Um, this just shows a little bit of the difference um, between corals with different levels of symbiont. These are the same species of corals. Uh, they're called plating corals. They grow out in a flat plate. Um, the one on the left there is much more chocolate brown and has many, a lot higher symbiont density in its tissues. The one on the right um, is a little greenish because it's a little bit deeper. Uh, it's much paler and has a much lower level of symbionts in its tissues than the, uh, the, than the one on the the left. These corals, um, Palau Acropora 190 and Palau Acropora 126, are not growing that far apart from one another. They're just uh, a couple miles apart from one another. Uh, but it exemplifies the range in symbiont load that we see in the in the natural population. We also see uh, something that was very similar to what Ross had um, had seen. That as the symbiont load goes up, uh, the retention of symbionts during a heating event drops. Uh, retention here is the fraction of the original chlorophyll that it's in a colony uh, that is retained after a heating event and high retention in the range of say um, 70 to 90 percent or so um, is a feature of corals that have relatively low symbiont load. Now granted there's a huge amount of scatter here um, but it's still a significant um, relationship um, and it's what uh, basically Ross had predicted by studying the corals he looked at in, in Florida. We can also then do the same kind of graph with, with, with growth. And there we see the opposite pattern that some, the corals that have higher symbiont load and presumably higher levels of nutrient flow from those symbionts have a substantially higher um, growth rate, about, about 25% higher for corals with a high symbiont load versus a low symbiont load. Again, there's a lot of scatter. There's a lot of other things affecting growth and just symbiont load out in the field. Uh, but it suggests that there may be actually a trade-off here, that finding corals that have really high heat, uh, heat tolerance is fine. Um, but if you do that, you're likely to be getting corals with relatively low symbiont load. If you get corals with rel relatively low symbiont load, uh, that you might be uh, transplanting or using corals that have relatively low growth. And so understanding that trade-off is an important part of using any of this information in terms of uh, making suggestions to, to local communities. Um, so one suggestion from all of this is that you don't just find the most heat resistant coral in the entire world and replicate that one uh, clone and just plant that. Um, you plant biologists would never do that anyway. Um, but it then it says uh, the diversity of the of what you're using in any kind of restoration or nursery setting is a really important part of the, the future of that in in coral reef settings. And in this case, not only because uh, gen high genetic diversity is important for lots of reasons like disease resistance, but also um, that there are hidden trade offs in these the physiology of these organisms. And then um, not just choosing the most extreme 
um, heat resistance is is probably a really good a really good idea in in these in these terms. Um, the um, the sort of upshot of all this, uh, sort of going from the basic phenomenon and trying to understand how variable it is, uh, looking at it, the adaptive capacity of different populations like the cave populations to, to adapt to, to CO2 gives us the idea that yes, there is adaptive capacity in marine organisms and even in corals to react to, to climate stress. And that's a really good thing. Um, if we want to use that information in the future, then we have to take another couple steps. And what I've tried to do uh, probably a little too slowly and agonizingly is go through the steps that you have to take in order to take this basic information and turn it into something, uh, something practical. Um, that set of practical use depends upon knowing quite a bit about the basic mechanism of adaptation. So you know whether it's permanent or temporary and whether there are intrinsic trade-offs. Um, involved. Um, the coral world has moved a lot in the last five years uh, away from mere protection of coral reefs to trying to sustain them by interventions in coral ecosystems to increase resilience to climate change. And I was part of a national U.S. National Academy of Sciences report on that for corals that tried to look at this precise um, question. Um, there's lots of different ways that people have been thinking about intervening in coral reefs to try to maintain their uh, their resilience, um, including a lot of uh, parts of uh, <clears throat> managed selection and managed breeding, um, changing their physiology, etc. I, I won't go into them in, in, in any detail, but the, the reports um, exist out there. A few of them are being used around the world in, in uh, small amounts of sort of small field trials, uh, particularly managed selection, but even things like sperm cryopreservation, uh, that is uh, a way of preserving genetic diversity of current corals for, for future use. Um, the, uh, the framework of all of this is like the framework of probably almost all ecosystem-based um, persistent studies is that uh, we have um, climate change to worry about, but we also have current stressors that come from local environmental change like pollution and land use. Um, and in the case of coral reefs, overfishing. Um, there are two of them together are really incredibly important to manage. Um, limiting climate change in the future is hugely important, but also uh, doing the things we already know ecologically about to preserve ecosystems has to be done in parallel. If you're doing those, then interventions to increase uh, reef persistence or other ecosystem resistance uh, persistence might might be really useful. But it requires this three part strategy, not just focusing on 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 one of them. And then finally, um, I want to sort of just essentially. Uh, sort of tee up a, a discussion about um, about where conservation biology kind of really is right now um, in science. And my my reading of it um, is that conservation science has been about understanding diversity and its ecological role, and that was a huge focus of conservation science in the 60s and 70s and the 80s. And then as those ecosystems became more and more um, impacted by uh, by human endeavors, then protecting that diversity, uh, and and then and then documenting the the value of that diversity to human ecosystems, like with uh, Gretchen Daly's Natural Capital Project and the uh, the economic work done um, all over uh, all over Europe. Um, Protecting it became a huge focus of conservation science, uh, but now I would say protecting it is no longer enough, uh, and that especially in a future of climate change coming, uh, that intervening to generate higher resilience in those, in those ecosystems to climate threats may well be the next step for, for conservation science. Uh, obviously, there's pluses and minuses to that. Obviously, there's risks. Um, but the risk of doing nothing is increasing year by year. Um, and at the end of the game, our, our job is to preserve as much as possible for the next century. Yes, I think we're on a path to reducing the impact of climate change by reducing emissions, but that's still taking a long time. And no matter what, there'll be climate effects. Um, those climate effects are going to be more and more severe over time. And so if our job as conservation scientists uh, is to do what? Preserve as much as possible, then we have to get through this century.
and that may be adding acting to increase resilience in ecosystems so that there's more ecosystems to recover from uh, when the climate finally stabilizes. So that's sort of the journey I have been on uh, with corals from the beautiful reef in Kalakakua Bay uh, to worrying about climate change, to trying to understand how much diversity there is and how much variation there is for, for adapting to, to heat and CO2 for these corals, and then taking it to the next level of trying to be a little bit more practical about it. Um, and I'm gonna end, end there. Uh, and sort of open up to questions and just thank you all for the the uh, the opportunity to, to to talk to you about this uh, to, to give a shout out to Nuria who's uh, who's here with us uh, for this great work that she has spearheaded and the collaborator she's put together all from Bologna and down through to Naples on the Mediterranean side and Chloe for that great picture thank you thank you a lot Steve uh, it's great to see this underwater perspective um, which reminds me a lot of trees and their associate organisms and mycorrhizae or the lichens uh, i think there's great parallels here in these systems mm -hmm. so i'd like to open the floor uh, for questions through the chat by raising hands or by the youtube channel who would like to start Any hands up here? <clears throat> Just a simple question uh, about the size of the gen genome of these corals, uh, just to have an idea. About the size of the change? Uh, of the genome. Ah, the coral genome is about 400 megabases. Okay. So it's quite small compared to, yeah. Right. Is at least, yes. <laughs> um, the genome for the symbionts is about two gigabases, two to three gigabases, depending upon the, the genus. Um, and when we, when we do an, an extraction of a coral to do the, the, the genomes, um, then uh, we have to balance out how much of the DNA is actually from the symbiont and how much from the, the coral. Uh, we have full genome sequences from all those corals from Palau, for example. Um, and uh, but low pass, low pass genomes to about one or two X uh, for them. And, but in order to do that and not get mostly symbiont data, then we have to kind of balance those two things out. Christian has a question too. Yes, thank you, Steve, for the nice talk. This was an impressive uh, talk of, to support genetic diversity and also probably move um, genotypes around uh, like we do in, in trees with assisted gene flow and assisted migration. But I have one question. I mean, when it comes to bleaching, it's, as I understood, it's not the coral that is the problem. It's the symbiont that is leaving. So shouldn't we rather focus on the genetics and the genetic diversity of the symbiont? And do people actually do that at all? Or is it mainly concentrated on the coral? Yeah, they people do work on the, the genetics of the of the symbiont. Um, and, and you're right that it depends a lot on the genetics of the, the symbiont. Um, whether the symbiont is leaving or whether the coral is spitting it out is maybe a nuance. <laughs> Um, but in our case, we know that um, corals with the same exact same symbiont react differently to heat. And so that's why we focused on uh, the coral side. Um, for folks who are focused on the symbiont side, the real question has been, well, why do some symbionts tolerate heat more than others? And, and we know that there's a, whole, there's a genus of the symbiont um, called Durastinium that can take about a half a degree higher temperature than the, the normal symbiont. And corals have Durastinium as well as this other genus. But there's a trade-off going on there as well. The, the, the symbiont that produces um, higher heat tolerance also produces a lot slower growth. 
they actually translocate less glucose to uh, the coral host. And so when we see corals in the field at bleach, they're often at the bleaching point shifted to these heat tolerant symbionts. But then as they recover, they shift back to the heat sensitive one. Um, so uh, folks uh, like Madeleine Van Oppen, who's a fabulous coral researcher at the University of Melbourne in Australia, has been doing experiments on trying to get the, the simulant populations to evolve higher heat resistance without the same cost of lower growth. And so, yes, people have been really trying to focus on that, trying to find like the sweet spot where you've got high tolerance and high growth um, in both the symbiont, and we're trying to do the same thing on the on the coral side. Would you even inoculate them with like heat tolerant symbionts? You can do that. Uh, Andrew Baker in Florida is kind of the world leader in 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 torturing corals to the point where they actually spit out their symbionts and then gives them the choice of another symbiont type uh, that they'll take up again and um, and and use. Uh, so he's worked out, for example, ways of, uh, you can take a very big coral, say it's a big dome, and bleach it. Then uh, what you've done, what you did a month ago was take a plug out of that coral and you took that plug into the lab and you switched the symbionts in that plug uh, to some other symbiont. And then you go out back to the, the, the coral that's bleached, you put that plug in with the new symbiont and it spreads around. But totally cool, um, but it's temporary. It doesn't last, <laughs> and so uh, that's the problem: is doing this kind of thing so that it actually does last, and you can then use it as a reliable uh, recommendation for a community that's asking for help. Okay, then Ben, you have a question. Yes, thanks a lot for your talk. I think you answered my question, but just to make to make it sure. Um, when you showed patterns, patterns of adaptation, uh, do you think there is this genotype-genotype interactions, meaning that you don't have necessarily adaptation, I mean, to heat resistance, for example, of the coral or the, the skeleton, but also the, the algae? Mm -hmm. um, and they are interacting together, like plus plus equal three or something like that? Is it what you observe? Um, we observe... Uh facets that seem to be like that. I mean, what, you, what you're saying is that it's not just the reaction of, of one part of this partnership. And that's the same thing that, um, that others were asking that the whole, the bleaching reaction is essentially the failure of the, of the symbiosis relationship. And that could basically be mediated on both sides, the host and, and the symbiont. Um, so, yes, probably the way the coral is reacting, the way it becomes heat resistant is um, in how it's interacting with the symbiont. And the only, the only other um, thing I can sort of add to that is that <clears throat> all of the genomic work that we've done on corals from Samoa and from Palau, which I haven't really gone into a huge amount of detail about, um, suggest that these differences among corals are not due to just one or two genetic changes. There's not one or one or two genes that cause heat resistance. Um, where we've, where we've looked, um, it looks like there's dozens or hundreds of genes that participate in causing heat tolerance uh, to, to be more higher in some corals than others. So we're treating it as a multi locus trait. Um, polygenic where uh, the individual coral has a certain number of genes that interact well with heat. Um, the same might be true on the symbiont side as well. And we, we don't understand that to anywhere near the same, the same degree as we do um, even in the corals. So when you do reciprocal transplant experiment, you also transplant the algae, not only the coral. Okay. Right, because they go along with it. and. Uh, one of my students right now, uh, Katrina Armstrong, is essentially taking those trans we've, transplants that we've been doing in Palau um, and essentially tracing the, the individual um, uh, symbiont genotypes over time um, as well. Do they, uh, 
when you transplant them together, do they essentially swap symbionts and then all and end up with the same symbiont in the common garden experiment, or do they keep the symbiont they came with? And and so we we don't know that for these particular experiments. In general, what people have found is that the corals will keep their symbionts unless you bleach them. And if they if you bleach the corals, then they start swapping. But we don't know that for these corals. Thanks. Okay, then we have a question in the chat from Ana Maria Gonzalez. Uh, <clears throat> she asks, in the study in which you were working with the acroporids, and you showed the picture of two of them with varying degrees of color, did you genotype the dinoflagellates? And do we know if that species of coral hosts multiple dinoflagellate species, or are they in species-specific mutualism? Yeah, great, great question. For those particular corals, we do have the genome sequences um, and the chloroplast sequences for those. Um, for those, and um, the answer for that is that they they share uh, the. They're very similar in their symbiont type. Uh, uh, but there are uh, a couple of small differences in the chloroplast genes uh, that show that they're, they're different strains of that one type of, of symbiont. Um, the strains are scattered across Palau very geographically, so they're very fine scale genetic structure in the symbiont populations themselves. Um, and at this point, we don't know anything about the functional differences among those, those different symbionts. Um, but I should say we also see differences in symbiont load from corals living on the same reef. So it isn't just geography that does it. It's not just depth. Um, it's not just nu nutritional status, um, but, but there's maybe some other interaction with the genetics of the symbiont um, as well. But yeah, we'd love to know more about that. We just haven't gotten there yet. There was a bit of interruption during your answer, but is that okay, Ana Maria? Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Fine. Then uh, Diana Weber has her hand up. Hi. Um, I have two questions. One is... Oh, it's hard to hear you, Diana, I think. Better now? A little. Okay. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, in, um, the in the same coral, coral colony, colony um, do you, find, do you different find different polyps, polyps with different symbionts, allowing, allowing one part of the colony, colony to grow faster and one part to be more heat resistant? Um, um, and, the and the second question is, do you think, do you think the, reason the reason that the corals, corals spit, out spit out the heat, heat resistant symbiont, symbiont and they take in one that is, that is more heat sensitive um, um, at an appropriate time is because, because this will allow them to grow a bit faster? faster. Could you follow? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was. It was. It was. It was tricky. Um, <laughs> you had a little bit of a of a um, an echo. Of an echo there, Diana. But so your question is: Do coral colonies have different symbionts in different parts of their coral colony that have different um, kinds of um, different sort of heat sensitivities? Um, and then um, is it? Uh, then the thing. The second question is: Is it possible that they're essentially? Um, using some symbionts to grow fast and other symbionts to to stay heat heat resistant if i if i've got that right you know maybe maybe give me the thumbs up <laughs> um, right <there>. yes yeah. <laughs> um, well done <laughs> yeah so um the first question is um do they have different kinds of symbionts in different parts of the colony not that we know of for this coral uh, these corals are called acropora hyacinthus. They grow as a tabletop. Uh, that it's kind of a flat tabletop that's that's facing uh, that facing sunlight. Um, but some really clever work um, some decades ago in the Caribbean showed exactly that pattern in some dome-shaped colonies on the reefs, where the top of the mound dome of, of the colony um, had one kind of symbiont, which was a uh, a sort of heat resistant um, and light insensitive uh, symbiont that grew fast. And then along the sides of the colony, uh, which were not in direct sunlight, they had a different kind of symbiont along there uh, that was more um, <clears throat> heat sensitive. Um, 
I'm sorry, the heat sensitive one is growing faster. The, the one on the top, the heat tolerant ones, was, was growing more slowly. Um, so it's possible that that goes on. Um, that kind of study hasn't been done exhaustively um, in different, place, different places. Um, but when we do look at the colonies we have, uh, and we, we use essentially the, the short read genome data and look among those reads to see which, uh, what kinds of signature we have from different symbionts inside, we can estimate how much of these two major kinds of symbionts, the heat sensitive and the heat tolerant uh, ones e that each colony has. Most colonies have 95 to, or, or even more percent of one or the other, um, but almost all of them have a little bit of the other one. There is a minor component of, in almost every one of these corals of the other major symbiont type. So almost every one has both, um, but um, mostly it's the fast growing one that they have. So some colonies have mostly the heat tolerant one. Um, so it's possible that they could be switching during bleaching um, and essentially holding on to this reservoir. You can say anthropomorphizing here, right? Um, you're holding on to this reservoir of heat tolerant um, symbionts for use when uh, the temperature goes up. Um, <clears throat> we don't understand what those reservoirs are like or why some, uh, some of those reservoirs are, are um, are larger than others, uh, and, and we don't know the the way the corals if is controlling that, or maybe it's the alga controlling it. So um, that's the other aspect of all this: how the coral controls the population levels of the alga within its own tissues is something that we're only now getting a little bit of a handle on, um, and it seems to be a fight for um, for nutrients and the corals controlling the symbiont by controlling its nutrient access. Okay, then, thank you. Is there any other questions from the audience directly or through the chat? Christian, please. If I may ask a second question. Um, if you now say, let's uh, move uh, genotypes or resistant genotypes around and kind of um, support adaptation to warmer water. Is there a physiological limit at some point or, or do you fear that even if you, you manage to find more heat and heat resistant genotypes, that at some point you reach like a, a limit where you can't go further? Are we getting into that danger or is, are we far away from that? Yeah, that's a great, a, a really fundamental question because if we're going to try to use these to 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 generate higher levels of heat resistance in, um, say, restored reefs, is can we just keep going and keep keep selecting and keep selecting? And you know, the the literature and uh, artificial evolution and artificial selection is that you get a fast result right off the bat and the first couple generations you make a lot of progress but after that it begins to tail off as you essentially eat into the adaptive genetic variation that's in in the population um and and we simply don't know uh for these corals what what the what the levels really are the 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 one thing that we have always known is that these these populations uh live across the world. Uh, the species that I work in works in Fren um, lives in French Polynesia all the way through the Pacific into the Indian Ocean to the coast of Africa. It lives um, as far north as Hawaii and as far south as um, the, the, the Cook Islands. That's like 15 degrees north to 20 degrees south. Um, so it's tens of thousands of kilometers <laughs> across the world and across different habitats that these that these this one species lives, and lots of corals do that. So given the huge amount of, gen of environmental variation the species already occupies, then I think one of the possibilities is that the evolutionary process over the last couple of million years has generated uh, either regional adaptations or polymorphisms for adaptations. That, that might, there might be a lot of them. Um, and that's where, you know, the, the original thing that, that Felix said about this kind of talk is that we have big populations with uh, lots of dispersal and a long phylogenetic history to build up 
uh, adaptive genetic variation in the, in, in the case of environmental variation. So thinking about it that way, I'm, I'm sort of guessing there's a lot of adaptive genetic variation out there that, that we could use. How, how much it's limited, I don't know. Can corals live at 40 degrees? No record of it anywhere. Um, can they live at 35 degrees quite happily? Though the Persian Gulf and, um, and the Middle East corals can do that. Uh, so is it possible? I don't know. Um, certainly we have to try and certainly have to do as much as we can to take the corals that exist right now and, and try to make it possible for them to, to get through the next 80 years. Which in corals is just one generation. It's like forest trees, you know, they they'll live a long time. If we can keep them alive, <laughs> they could make it all the way through. <laughs> well, but, I mean, in one way you, you see trees standing around for a lot of, uh, for a long time span, but in the end, they might not success, successfully reproduce because they're juveniles they don't match the current climate or the future climate so uh, they're just hanging in as trees but they will not reproduce and produce new forests so that's one thing that we yeah. should keep in mind but here's a question for you for you guys who are long live long live plant people um you know plants produce uh, seed and pollen from uh the the vegetative structures they have sort of like corals do that produce eggs and sperm from the polyps that are growing in the colonies um so uh have there been examples of where basically long-lived forest trees are evolving over time so that uh the vegetative structures are mutating and and becoming adapted to local climate conditions or local environmental conditions and then passing that on to seeds and pollen I mean, there is certainly somatic mutation on one side, and then uh, you once mentioned it, uh, there's epigenetics that might be uh, or play a key role in this process as well, which we still don't know much about. Well, that's so we've been we've been delving into the somatic mutation business for for older corals and and uh, the question for 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 plants is do those have people looked at the somatic mutations in plants in order to sort of see whether or not they're under selection and whether they're passed when they're passed to seeds or pollen that is, is there the capacity for those somatic mutations to add to um, their adaptive genetic load? So there are two studies with oaks that has been performed looking at somatic mutations. They are quite rare and but they're adaptive potential their adaptive role it's unclear i would say so but yeah. they are there but not as not as abundant as we would think of but it's not so easy i think also with all the filtering steps and everything to really judge judge it but oaks have been used for studying this now this is a series of other tree species as well that have been uh, checked for that and uh, it looks quite similar to the oaks it's uh, few mutations, but they're there. You see it in a modular way in, within a tree, that you have certain parts of the crown that is one uh, genotype lineage and another one uh, differs in uh, a couple of mutations. So you actually have a mosaic of genotypes within the crown, potentially, yes. Mm -hmm. So I have a, 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 a grad student who just finished, Laura um, lopez Nandam. Uh, who's just basically has been looking at somatic mutations in corals at a, at a really high level of resolution. And you're totally right, Christian, the, the amount of, the amount of sequencing that went into that is just in, enormous because you've got to do everything in, in duplicate or quadruplicate in order to make your sequence error rate lower than the somatic mutation rate. So um, it's an enormous, enormous, enormous data set. Um, but when she's done that, she's been finding quite abundant somatic mutations in corals that are decades or centuries old. Um, similar to what you're saying, Felix, that it looks like uh, the, the coral itself is a patchwork of, of slightly different somatic mutations. 
Um, the real challenge is to do enough deep sequencing to raise the level of those somatic mutations to the point where you can begin to ask questions like, you know, what's the what's the replacement to silent ratio? How much of the how much of the mutations are in coding regions? Are, are any of them adaptive at all? Um, there's a small number of them, though. So question questions like that are hard to answer. But okay. in our case, you know, finding corals that are 200 years old is not hard. Uh, finding corals that are 500 years old is rarer, but there's a bunch of them. And so if you look at an animal that's been sitting in the same, on the same reef for 500 years and ask, is that the same, is that like an old genotype from 500 years ago? <laughs> or is it a new genotype because it keeps, keeps evolving as it grows? Mm -hmm. Don't know. So time is moving. We're approaching six o'clock, at least uh, our Central European time. Um, I would like to kind of summarize uh, or what I take as a to uh, message from your talk now is that when looking at trees, I think we should care more about what's growing along with trees. And I think uh, when we want to see how trees evolve or how they adapt to environmental change, uh, their their ectomycorrhizal fungi will probably uh, get much more attention in the next coming years because they might play a key role in in this forest system, uh, not just the tree genotypes, but also the associated organisms might be highly relevant. And it's, it's in a similar way, like with the um, coral and its uh, algae, I think it's a system of two and we need to deeply look into how they get along with each other and how both sides evolve eventually. So with That's this, right. I would like, I'm oh, sorry, I interrupted you, Steve. No, not at all. Absolutely. I, you know, the, the, the I have a colleagues here at Stanford who, who are really basically looking a lot in the, the, the fungal dynamics of soils and trees and, and different, uh, different ecosystems. And uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of hidden mysteries there for sure. Yeah. Okay, then I would like to conclude this final seminar of today uh, or of the series. And I would like to hand back to Christian for final remarks if this is what you would like to do, Christian. Thanks again, Stephen, for uh, Thank you. your talk and your answers. Uh, it was great having you here tonight or this morning, whatever. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thanks for all the organization to put these things together. It's, it's really it's a lot of work, I know, and it's really appreciated. Yeah, thank you, Felix, and thank you, Stephen, Steve, again for the nice talk. I make only two quick announcements towards the end of this seminar series. So all the talks and all the seminars are available on YouTube, all four. Also, the ones uh, from the last series on polygenic adaptation are available on YouTube. So if you missed something, you can watch it still there. And finally, I make my uh, announcement again that we will host this year uh, in September, the first Evil Tree Conference on genomics and adaptation in forest ecosystems. We have now uh, completed the list of keynote speakers. I think it's a very nice list that we have. We already have a few dozens of registrations. So if you have not registered yet, please do it and hope to see you in September. Um, if this was a big success, we are also thinking about uh, uh, making a new seminar series in autumn, but we will decide about this later. So thank you for attending and hope to see you again. Ciao, thanks very much.